Hi, everybody. Um, nice to be here and share some of our work on first person video. And um, let me start by showing you, oh, there we go, a video of first person perspective. So in AR, we need to think about this when we talk about machine perception, that now we're seeing the world through a camera wearer's eyes. And there's two sides to thinking about this. One is the fact that certain things are going to be harder and different than the kind of video we're used to processing often in computer vision. Um, and this includes the fact that now you're talking about passively captured, always on camera, that's giving you uncurated data. There's also the fact that it's um, often multimodal with audio or IMU and other um, cues. And at the same time, we're getting special insight from this video stream itself. Things about the agent, meaning here in AR, the person's actions, their interactions and their attention. And so it's really quite important and interesting to think about this video from the first person perspective as a first class citizen and think about the kind of problems that come up in the AR context um, when we want to have information and understanding in the context of this um, individual's point of view. So I'm gonna highlight some of the recent work from my group looking at first person perception from video. And specifically, there's two things that I wanted to cover. The first one is going to zoom in on the multimodal aspect. And so talking about um, audio and visual content together in order to separate the voice of someone that you wanna hear in a noisy environment or someone that you wanna hear among all other speakers in the environment. And this is um, well motivated in the AR setting. And then secondly, I'll show how uh, we can start to map an environment even with brief first person exposure from both the audio and visual streams. So this is all about audio and vision together. The last part of the talk, then I'll turn to the data question. And here I wanted to highlight some of our recent work looking at relating first and third person perspectives for video in order to address activity recognition problems. And then finally, I'll give a teaser on the uh, newly released uh, project Ego4D, and this is a large scale egocentric video data set. So that is the agenda for the rest of this talk, and I'll start right in with the audiovisual work. So let us think about the AR headset of the future that we would wear in a crowded environment where many sounds may be present, including other speakers and speakers that we want to pay attention to. This is a well-known problem called the cocktail party problem um, that humans can do to some degree, um, but uh, we'd like our machines to be able to do them so that they could enhance speech for us to make our listening easier or to help someone who has a, um, an impairment that might make this ex exceptionally or especially valuable. So how do we um, separate the speech of the listener that we care about? For many years, this problem had been tackled from the audio stream alone, but certainly vision can give us extra information to do it even better. So in the visually guided audio separation task, you have the visual stream um, comprised of video frames, and then you also have the audio. And the idea in this task is that the audio is mixed. It's mixed from at least two sources, and your job is to be able to pull out the individual sound sources, and this would allow a system to listen to just one or the other. And there's been some great work lately looking at this problem and including really getting the, the video to be a, a key ingredient to do this task well. Now I'm gonna talk about our approach in this, um, in this uh, realm and I wanna motivate it first with an, a quiz for you. And that is to think about how faces relate to voices. So here I'm showing five faces and I'm gonna play a voice and your job is to guess which one it is. Enfin, alors bon, euh, moi je suis une novice, hein, pour le coup, j'ai jamais vu ça euh, concrètement, mais c'est deux mois. You may have a guess that it's phase two. Um, and maybe this one was on the easy side. She seems to be the, the one female voice in this lineup here. I'll give you one more, maybe a bit more difficult. People being um, cool, and, and you can see that uh, in, in daily life. You might have a guess for this one too. Uh, this one was phase four. All right, so we're playing this game to make the point that there is certain priors about a voice that you can read out of the face. And in fact, this has been explored in the literature for um, learning cross-modal embeddings that link the face of an individual to an encoding for their voice. So that you could have similar, you know, 
uh, agreeing face voices together in this space and those that are different far apart. Now this has been done in the past for the sake of person identification. So that you'd wanna know who, who is the ID for the speaker and learn embeddings for it this way. What we're looking at here is different, but we wanna leverage this idea and think about it in the context of AV speech separation. And the insight that we have is that these are mutually beneficial tasks. So on the one hand, if we have done a good job at separating speech in a video into different soundtracks, then this would allow us to learn better embeddings for the face and voice connection, because these would be clean audio streams that we're trying to embed. In the reverse direction, if we had done a good job of learning the embeddings so that faces appear near their voice, uh, their voice counterparts, then we could have an easier time doing the separation because we would have a clean embedding. And so this is what we wanted to explore, kind of this synergy between both of the tasks. And the main idea we have then we call visual voice. The, the name being, you know, I'm gonna hear the voice, but because I have a visual prior seeing the speaker that I'm trying to listen to, then I will filter for their voice only. And the idea is to, to, to capitalize on that synergy I just mentioned. So we're gonna jointly train for AV speech separation and cross-modal face voice embeddings. That means during training, you'll have some mixed speech as input on a pair of training samples. And for each one, you'll observe their lip motion, you'll observe their face, and you will be aiming to separate their speech as well as the speech of the person's voice with which it was mixed in a way that satisfies these cross-modal embedding constraints. Okay, so I'm putting both those objectives together, um, top-down view here. Okay, now I'll say a little bit more of the approach. Um, there's two parts. So one, we need to separate the speech and for this, we build an AV speech separator network that's going to look at the lip motion analysis through some 3D convolutional network on the, the lip regions on the face. Uh, on the other side, we're going to look at some image features taken from the face in, of its, in its entirety. And now we'll fuse those visual inputs and uh, use them in conjunction with the audio. Now in training, the audio comes in mixed. We'll convert that to a spectrogram. Um, and then push it through an encoder decoder. This is a UNET style architecture in which we can tile in this visual input and use the two of them together to output a complex mask. And this is a mask a matrix that will select for in that input spectrogram, the voice of the target person, the target being whoever's appearance we're looking at here. Okay, so this is an AV speech separator network that we can train to find um, the separated speech for the visual input. Now, more importantly, let's look at then how we put together these tasks. And it's a multitask training framework where we're gonna have pairs of faces at a time. So consider this first pair, A and B. We'll observe their lip motion, we'll observe their mixed audio, just really add the audio from both those voices on top of each other. Look at the spectrogram for the mixed audio, apply that separator network I just mentioned and compute the estimated masks. Now we'll do the same thing for a second pair, again, hinging off of speaker B, but now with another sample of speaker A from, can be from the same video, just a different time point, and do the same. And now finally, we have from those masks, estimated spectrograms for each of the voices, separate A separated from A1B and A separated from A2B, and et cetera. Now from these audio inputs, we are in going to incur um, uh, two additional losses. So one that's going to look at the vocal properties. So the sound properties of each of those spectrograms with some embedding. And for that, we will impose a loss that says, we better have the voice sounding similar for speaker A at time one and speaker A later at time two. So those should be pulled together. Uh, and conversely, the, the B should be pushed apart. That's the speaker consistency loss. And the final third loss is going to do that cross-modal face voice part of the embedding where we say, we would like the voice to, to agree with the embedding for the face for the respective images and disagree otherwise. Okay, and that's the cross-modal matching loss. So we train a model for this task then as a whole, looking at all three losses, both 
get the right separation, get the good cross-modal embedding and have the speaker's voices be consistent when the same speaker reoccurs. So I've shown you then how the model is composed. Let's look at some results. I'm gonna first do this with some in the wild videos um, where I show you the, uh, the noisy or overlapping speech and then we'll listen to what visual voice hears when it attends to one face or another. So here's the mixture first. No, you became no, a superstar. No, I did not. Yes, no, you did. I did not. No, I sure did you not. did. From Are me, you gonna, are I you gonna let me full speak credit. my piece? If you're talking am, to me now, am I, gonna speak I gave my you piece? full credit for that. Am I gonna speak my piece or not? Go am ahead. I gonna speak my piece or not? Go ahead. Okay, because you wanna interview me. I ain't interviewing you. Okay, so we've seen this very often, um, voices on top of each other. Here's the cocktail party, but in the talking head kind of world. So let's hear what visual voice would separate for the right speaker. No, 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 I did not. No, I did not. No, I did not. Are you gonna let, are you gonna let me speak my piece? Am, am I gonna speak my piece? Am I gonna speak my piece or not? Am I gonna speak All my right. piece or not? And we can do the same okay, you for the left speaker. Me. Well, you became a superstar. Yes, you did. Sure you did. From me, I gave you full credit. If you're talking to me now, I gave you full credit for that. Okay, and one more video example I was gonna show you where in this case, it's not um, two speakers side by side, but this is someone in a noisy restaurant. Suppose you were wearing an AR headset and this is someone across from you who you want to hear better amidst all the noise. So this is what you'd originally hear. I haven't measured it, but it's cut down the noise um, to a point where uh, we have the right vibe that it's an action kind of place. And then here's what you could hear with proper sound source separation here computed with visual voice. I haven't measured it, but it's cut down the noise um, to a point where we have the right vibe that it's an action kind of place. Okay, so we can see that now we can enhance the speech listening for the voice, in particular the one that will sound like it's emanating from the person that we're looking at. So those were just um, some fun kind of in the wild videos that successfully get separated. We've tested this model on um, all the benchmarks out there for sound source separation comparing to all published results. And for these five data sets, Visual Voice is giving state-of-the-art uh, uh, output. All right, so where we've been going next with this work um, and for, for speech separation in the audio-visual domain has been to make it an active problem. So what I just showed you is passive in the sense that it's video. Um, you know, whatever video we receive, that's what we get and we're, we're tasked with separating the sound. But we like to envision where we'd have control over the camera. And so this is potentially an AR where we could have um, di directional control on a, a camera or, or a microphone and certainly in robotics where we would have the ability to change our positioning. And our idea is to let the sound and vision guide an agent that knows how to move intelligently in order to perform the separation task. And this is work that's appearing in the main conference this week called Move to Hear, where we set up a task where you have an agent who starts, say, at the starred position in this 3D scene in the midst of mixed audio coming from different directions. And then it learns a policy in order to move intelligently in this space here around the countertop so that it can hear one of the in interesting sources, S3, better. And so this is. Uh, a navigation, um, navigational agent that knows how to move to do the separation task. And that's all I want to say about this model, but more of a, 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 a um, teaser for it. And it, it's kind of the next step going from passive audio source separation to its active embodied counterpart. All right, so, so far I've talked about AV for listening better, and this could help us with with um, intelligent AR devices to do so in, in, uh, in real life. Um, another thing that I wanna consider quite a bit different though, is to use the audiovisual stream in order to map. And the task that we're considering here is to take a short video, short meaning it's not gonna cover an entire house and can we nonetheless infer the layout of the entire home. So in my picture here, suppose this was a camera trajectory in blue that's viewing a part of this house, if we were to use the visual stream to do mapping, we can only get so far, right? Because there's only so much of the environment we've actually observed. But vision's great for doing it. It's that the issue is vision will expect that we, you know, see the parts of the environments we wanna map. But what we realized is that if we look at this video, both with the visual and the audio stream, we'll be able to see much more of the map. 
And that's what this cartoon is suggesting here. Two things. One, simply the fact that audio is bouncing around in this environment will reveal some of its geometry about how far away walls are from the camera, where there's free space, where there's not. And secondly, because there are semantically meaningful sounds like a shower running from the bathroom that you can't see or a TV blaring from a living room that you did not enter. These kind of semantic sounds will also tell you something about the layout of the space. So this um, idea, our goal then is to learn from short videos with audio, in fact, spatial audio, how to infer both an interior map, which is the free space and occupied space of the entire environment, as well as a room map, which is a label map saying where the kitchen is, where the bathroom is, and so on. Now this work is work also appearing at the main conference ICCV this week. So let me say a bit about this approach. Um, what we did was to start with our sound spaces audio simulation platform. Think of this as um, the, the acoustic addition to what are really real world scan environments um, that compose Matterport 3D, Replica. Um, these are existing resources. And what we've added is the ability to render sound in these spaces. Realistic sound, accounting for geometry, materials, where the microphone is, where the source is. So this in the simulator, we can run experiments and even generate the videos we need to be able to test this concept of AV floor plan creation. And we've done it in two ways. Um, we've done this with device generated sounds. We've done it with environment generated sounds. The difference being in the device generated mansion moving around and the AR headset or your phone is emitting a device, uh, emitting a sound to which you can listen to the echo responses. Um, and then the other one is just more opportunistic, saying whatever sounds are in the environment, those are the ones we leverage. So we've tested both, trained and tested with both those kinds of sounds. And the, the approach is supervised. So we have full ground truth maps of spaces. We have egocentric RGB photos or video streams. And we learn a mapping that can take us from the pixels plus the audio to produce a dense classification map of the the nearest, say, 40 or 60 meters squared um, at each time step. Okay. And for time, I'm actually going to, to um, go forward with this. We have an encoder-decoder model that can do this and furthermore do this with self-attention over time so that we can predict um, the, the floor plan from both the audio and visual streams. Here's an example of the kind of output we get on the left, visualized in 3D, where you have the camera pose or the camera position and direction shown with the orange cones. And you have the visual only map, the one that you would get just by projecting depth to the ground plane shown in cyan. And finally, you have the AV floor plan in light green. This is a much bigger area that we're able to capture. And it gives you um, evidence of how the AV floor plan idea lets you, quote, see behind you, because the sounds are bouncing off walls behind the camera or behind walls uh, or through and behind walls so that you can see a much fuller version of the map. And we've been able to show this is better, not only than um, the, the, the model that tries to do this with vision alone, but even the model that tries to extrapolate the vision and trains for this extrapolation just as we do, but only using vision. Here's a video showing a result. You'll see some environment generated sounds and the map start to accumulate on the right hand side. Okay, so here, I hope you could hear some of those household sounds. There was someone typing in the office, there was someone knocking on the door and a phone was ringing. And meanwhile, we're carving out the map pretty broadly in that space shown on the right in the light green compared to, again, that vision only baseline that looks in the cyan part. And for more videos like this or to get a feel for what it's doing in these environments, you can look to our project webpage. In short, when you apply AV map, you can, improve over what you'll get, as I've been showing, you know, with vision alone, but also what you would get with um, an audio-based method um, and even a method that tries to extrapolate from the vision. And one way to capture the, the kind of results we're getting so far, you observe just about 26% of the space and you can estimate the whole space, like a whole level of a house 
with about 66% accuracy. So room to go on the accuracy, um, but encouraging result for where audio from this egocentric camera would help us succeed in a, a task that's useful um, for first person visual understanding. All right, so in the remaining few minutes, I'm gonna talk about um, very briefly an idea for connecting ego and exocentric views. And then the last bit I'll preview or you know, give a overview of the ego 4D data set. Okay, and for time, I'm gonna make this ego exo part rather brief. Um, we are very aware you know, that third person data or exocentric data is a different animal than first person. You saw that in the beginning of my talk and here's a great example to contrast how the visual experiences are so different. And you know, it's for all the reasons of the viewpoint but also the content and the purpose of its capture. And unfortunately, video data sets in our community so far have been um, imbalanced in this regard. You know, first person has had um, much less data and certainly much less diverse data available compared to what people have played with for a while now in the third person realm, as shown in the left. Things like kinetics, YouTube 8 million, activity net. So there's a, an imbalance here. Uh, and you might think just pre-train on third person data and let's get the rest out of ego video, ego video by fine tuning on it. But this has been shown to be really inferior. Um, so what we've proposed in ego exo is an idea to leverage third person video, um, but not as solely as pre-training for labels on it, but instead add auxiliary tasks that try to push out the ego-like, ego egocentric-like features from the third person data. And there's three of them that we, we try for. One that can say whether or not a video is, looks egocentric, whether it can, we can detect the objects and whether there's um, where and how are the hand and objects interacting. So all three of those are things that we expect to be prominent in egocentric video. And even if it's not prevalent in the third person data, we can require that the features we learn from such third person data um, be predictive of these three. And that, that in a nutshell is what ego exo does. Um, and it allows us to learn features that are good for first person data while still leveraging third person video, which has been widely available in order to train it. And things worked out well for the results. Um, I won't have time to go to the details, but this, you can think of ego exo as a good pre-trained model now for ego video feature extraction. All right, finally, in my last a um, couple of minutes, let me highlight the Ego 4D data set. And this is a, a massive effort that's just coming um, out. I guess it was two days ago now that we published on archive this paper, Ego 4D, Around the World in 3,000 Hours of Egocentric Video. This is a collaborative effort with all the people you see listed, listed here from Facebook AI, as well as 13 different universities. And uh, there'll be a workshop tomorrow actually focused on, for a half day, focused on Ego 4D. So if this gets you interested, I hope that you'll come to see this workshop tomorrow. What it is, a large scale, massive, 3000 hour plus data set of first person video that we hope will really facilitate research in egocentric perception. It has 3000 hours of content from 74 worldwide locations and many hundreds of scenes, some of them scanned, over 850 individuals wore cameras from many walks of life and ages up until the 80s, um, male, female, different occupations, not just graduate students. And these people were capturing daily life activities. So things they would do in their free time at home, working, commuting. And that's significant actually, because this is exactly the kind of stuff you want an AR system to be understanding of or, or to have perception succeed in this daily life activity. And we're providing with the data a benchmark challenge, actually a very, uh, a multi-part benchmark challenge that we hope people will be able to compete and improve methods among the, over those that we're providing with the data. The paper's out and the data comes out just over one month from now. Here are all the, the teams that com came together for this effort. I mentioned Facebook AI as well as 13 universities. These universities were assembled for their expertise, um, as well as, as you can see here, this great geographic diversity. And what it means is now you've got eyes um, in these uh, egocentric views across many parts of the world, which is a big step in terms of um, diversity available in any such data set. 
here's a sampling of what the data looks like. Um, I promise I won't, we're not going to try and view 3,000 hours of excerpts, but this will give you a taste. You know, this is indoor, outdoor. It's people interacting with each other. It's people interacting with objects. It's people doing different interesting visual occupations like landscaping, um, baking, mechanics. Um, it's, it's outdoor events, as I mentioned. It's different weather. It's different parts of the world, as we've said. And you can see all of this coming out in the samples. We're very excited to release it. We have annotations for um, all the video in form of text on every, every step of action that happens, as well as labels to go with the benchmark tasks. Aside from the visual streams, it is multimodal. There's audio on a good portion of the data, IMU, stereo on some of it, 3D scans of the environments for some of it, and multiple synchronized cameras. Sam, we are, we are almost at time. So I don't sure. know. If... Yeah, let me close up here. We have five benchmark tasks. Again, if you're interested, you can come to the Eagle4D workshop tomorrow to learn about in detail what these tasks all mean. Basically different things we expect to span egocentric perception. And now we have annotations with this data to, to um, study them. And again, workshop tomorrow to learn more. I'll stop here. Thanks so much for your attention. Um, I'm highlighting the first authors on the bits of work that I highlighted in this talk. Thank you.